International Developments in Group Schema Therapy. So I thought it was appropriate to start out with a photo of the Church of the Spilled Blood in St. Petersburg, Russia, because that's the last place we were about a month ago in doing training in group schema therapy. Now I have this picture because you can see how very serious the Russians are. And then you can see how Ida managed to convert them with the use of play and group schema therapy. And that guy's a psychiatrist. <laughs> yeah, his shirt says 90% angel. And then this is the first class that completed uh, a module in group schema therapy in St. Petersburg. And they were clearly very happy at the end. So we're assisting mental health in Russia. But at any rate, today you'll hear from a number of speakers who've been working to adapt the, the group, group schema therapy model that began for the treatment of BPD, who've adjusted it to fit the various patient populations that they have, or there are also some who are treating borderline patients. And our first speaker, Neela Rice, will, uh, who we actually began collaborating with in 2008, just after the, the um, conference in Coimbra, where we discovered that both all of us were working on inpatient groups for borderline patients. What we've discovered as um, this work has developed is the need for a, a specific enough training manual that people would be able to replicate what we were doing, but that also allowed for the flexibility and creativity of schema therapy to continue. Joe and Ida and I have pretty much worked in the same setting, the inpatient setting, for years. And one of the difficulties that we experienced when we started schema therapy was that um, a lot of our co-therapists were really novice therapists, really new to therapy in general and schema therapy in specific. So um, what we needed to do was train those therapists to be able to, to run the groups that were in these settings and also One really important detail that we all noticed in the inpatient settings and the daycare settings that we've been working with is that the milieu is extremely important. If you have a punitive milieu, it has been said a couple of times in other presentations I've heard, um, if you have a punitive milieu, you can do a lot of psychotherapy and it's not going to work because the next person is just going to destroy what you just achieved in the session pretty much. So really what you need to do in these settings is create a very safe and therapeutic atmosphere for the patients and do GST, so group schema therapy, ideally with two therapists so that one therapist is working with the patient as in the original model and the second patient and the, the second therapist keeps a connection to all patients so that none of them feels like left out or drops out or the attention is lost. It's really important, especially in these severe milieus. And another component that we have discovered is just necessary in these milieus and is not often recognized is supervision. 
team supervision is necessary. And that includes nursing staff, that includes creative therapists, that includes a lot of other professions, not only the psychotherapists. Um, okay, we have, for us, we try to define which are the core components for us that we have to, to teach patients in, this, in these settings. So, of course, they have to be educated on modes. They have to understand what modes are and how they experience modes. That's, that's kind of a basic, a given. The next thing is they have to know how they can become aware of the modes. What does it mean when I am in detached protector? How can I, how can I experience this mode? What do I think when I am in this mode? The next component then for us is, it's all part of schema therapy, it's all part of the big picture. So the next component is cognitive and behavioral schema therapy interventions, changing thoughts, changing behaviors, and of course experiential interventions. They are the big things, right? There are imagery exercises and chair work and stuff like that. So, so this is how we define the core components that are going to be part of the manual. The next thing in these settings is we have a time-limited focus. We can't keep patients forever in these settings. Um, and it's, we don't want to keep them forever in these settings. So what we did is we, we developed a 12-week program and we divided it in six weeks because, in two sets of six weeks, because often inpatient settings only have six, four to six weeks to actually work with the patients. Not, not everybody has three months. And what we did is, Every week we focus on one specific mode. So all the groups, all the individual focuses on working with that mode. That makes it easier for new therapists because if they have to switch very often between, between modes, especially in very severe patients, it gets difficult for them. It's easier for experienced therapists, but that, that is something that really makes it easier. Um, okay, so how do we start? The starting process is always psychoeducation because that's what the patients need at the beginning. They need to understand the concepts quickly and you can either always do it in individual or you can do it in a group setting. So what we do is five hours of psychoeducation at the beginning of treatment, pretty much like a mass experience at the beginning. Um, this is really the only group that we have in these treatment programs that focuses on all modes in one week. All other groups focus on one mode per week. Okay, I'm going to show you a few handouts so you know what we're actually working with when we're working with this patient. So when we're in the session for detached protector mode, this is the handout that the patients will be given. There is a description at the top about what does detached protector feel like, how, how do they feel like when they're in detached protector mode, what could be feelings associated with it, how could, how could they experience it, such as disconnected or bored or different things. And then we work with them in the group setting as when I am in detached protector mode, I feel. How do I feel in that moment? And if I'm in de detached protector mode, what do I think? So we try to go through the different component levels with them and make it pretty systematic so they understand quickly what are, kind of, what are the key features of this mode. And then we try to, to tell them there's different versions. Not everybody experiences detached protector the same way. Some people are more avoidant. Some people have overcompensating, more pushing modes. Some people have just normal detached protector modes. They feel very empty and um, yeah, dizzy sometimes. Okay, this would be the handout for vulnerable child mode. It's always the same structure. The structure is always... Um, pretty much explain the mode and then go to the feelings, the thoughts, the typical actions, typical situations that are associated with it. We always use the figures because that makes it catchy throughout the whole manual that the patients can always refer to these figures. Next one is angry child mode. And in the end of this, the five sessions, we also have the goals of schema therapy. So we try to explain to the patients what are the general goals regarding these modes. And then what you can do in individual therapy is elaborate on the specific goals for the patient. Makes it much easier for novice therapists if they know what the general goals are and then they can actually work in the individual session with their patient. What are the specific goals? Um, within the manual, we um, pro provide therapist instructions for each page. So there is a verbal instruction. What could the therapist say? As in, um, 
the goals of uh, schema therapy can be blah, 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 blah. And there's also a nonverbal um, instruction. So keep eye contact, smile, integrate the group, make big gestures. It's all provided in the manual to make it really, really explicit. Because I think one of the big problems is so far with the manuals um, that it's not so explicit what, what the key features are to keep the people, especially in the group setting, connected. And of course there's therapist tips, what can we do to reinforce cohesiveness and so on. Okay, mode awareness group is for patients to become more aware of being in one mode and to distinguish different modes from one another. Um, also the biographic cr connections and triggers are really important. Um, and of course to become aware of their own ability, of their own the, the the possibility to make choices. Ooh, five minutes. That is pretty bad. <laughs> okay, I'm going to show you just one handout on this. Um, so this is pretty much they go through the week, and there is an example provided. And we always look at the situation. We look at the thoughts, feelings, physical exp experiences, the need behind it, make it explicit, and then the childhood connection of for this mode. So, and in the se second set of six weeks, there is the healthy adult point of view and the healthy adult skills that one could use, experiential skills or, also, or um, support skills or whatever, and then the consequences they experience when switching in a, um, yeah, in a healthy adult mode. Cognitive and behavioral therapy group is, um, of course, the pattern breaking group. And what we do is we try to make a mode management plan in the end. How do I manage when I'm in angry child mode? How do I manage when I'm in detached protector mode? And you always have to distinguish the short term. How can I, how can I react short term when I'm in this mode? And in the long run, what can I do to reduce this mode? This is basically working on schemas. And this is something that is underlooked at kind of in, in, in patient settings. Okay, so these would be handouts for this group that we have. There's always again an explanation for for what does this mode feel like um, also what does the sad child for example or the vulnerable child mode need to hear from a good parent and then there's the skills part on the on the other side so there's the behavior pattern breaking the cognitive pattern breaking and the experiential pattern breaking as the three components and we do this for the short term or the long term this would be the long term handout okay and exper in the experiential schema therapy group, which is kind of the core schema therapy group, we do a lot of experiential exercises such as imagery rescripting or chair techniques to make corrective emotional experiences for the patients. So one of the things that we would do there is effigies, effigy work and use these effigies in role plays um, or imagery exercises as you know them from individual. And the individual is 12 sessions in total. That's what we're going to provide in that manual. And the therapist can always choose from the cognitive intervention, the behavioral intervention, or the experiential intervention. And of course, you have to apply limited reparenting to all of those. That it wouldn't work otherwise. OK, there's therapist scripts given as well for that. Um, so this would be a cognitive schema therapy component handout that the therapists could choose to work on with um, the patient. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is to develop a structured manual for a time limited, limited setting, especially for novice therapists or co-therapists working in these settings. That a manual that also gives enough flexibility for experienced therapists because they, they can really do more they don't have to stick to the handouts, but they have the choice to draw from the handouts. The only data we can provide so far on BPD, we've all run BPD pilot studies, and this, this manual is effective for, for DBT, for uh, BPD. Ooh, <laughs> see how nervous I am. <laughs> um, but really what we need, because most, um, most inpatient and daycare settings work with mixed populations, so we really need data on that. So if anybody's interested to run research with that manual, please contact us. Thank you. Twelve individual sessions in total in the twelve weeks. So one session per week. And twelve group sessions. Um, 
No, more than that, more group sessions. They have, um, they have about eight hours of group per week in, the, in that setting. But you could, of course, have it in an outpatient setting, just stretch it to two years or something. It's just the condensed setting in the inpatient ward that you need a lot of group therapy. Yeah. to be delivered in a number of different settings in a number of different time frames. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what we see as kind of a core of the foundation for people yeah. with severe personality. Mm -hmm.